Hello there! Welcome to the Saroid channel wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing remarkably well. I'm doing great, thank you very much. And we've got a fabulous story tonight which you're going to absolutely enjoy. But before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up. And let's get started with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, She's completely clueless. She has no idea what is lurking in the dark shadows, clandestinely scrutinising her every move and following her around very cautiously like a ghost. I know so much about her, yet the irony of ironies is she knows nothing about me. As far as she knows, I don't even exist. But that will soon quickly change on the one-hour train journey from New York to Hackensack this afternoon. Indeed, after she encounters me, I very much doubt she will ever forget me. Some people you meet leave an indelible imprint on your life, do they not? But let's face it, how many of us actually remember what we ate for dinner last Tuesday night? Or who sat opposite us on a train or bus journey that we took two years ago? You don't remember those intrinsic details at all. Or your brain would be storing up a lot of completely useless information that has no impact on your life whatsoever. Which is why we only remember the things that make an impression on us. To all intents and purposes, it's safe to say, in her case, she will always remember me. The man who crossed her path in less than auspicious circumstances. Let's face it, you don't forget a grand entrance like that. No matter how much you might wish to erase or even obliterate the memory from your mind. As nasty, gunky things have a way of sticking fast to you. And letting them go is never easy. So let's just say, I'm reasonably confident that she will never forget me. I'm biding my time, of course. Waiting for the perfect moment or opportunity when my script to this story will unfold and finally be played. I will play my part to the very best of my ability. Let's just say I've already rehearsed my lines and I can only hope that things will go as seamlessly as I anticipate they will. But I have thought about how I should react in all manner of scenarios. So I prepared myself for the very worst but I predict that things will go to my favour today. As I glance in her direction, she scurries along the pavement. She's on her way to Grand Central train station, moving very quickly as she always does. She's as predictable as the weather. I pretty much know everything about her, almost as if she was an open book. It's amazing what you can glean from a single person by just studying them intensely. For the last couple of weeks, this woman has pretty much been the subject that has consumed my entire focus. For very good reason, of course. She always seems to be in a tearing hurry, moving fast whenever she walks, like a lot of people tend to do in this part of New York. So many people in this big, bustling, booming city always seem to be rushing, as if they're living on their adrenaline. You only have to glance down the street to see the resolute determination on people's faces as they make their way steadily to work. In her case, she marches down the street while swinging her arms and legs, almost as if she's power walking. I read somewhere that people who walk very fast are happier than those who waddle down the road at a snail's pace. I acquired some of this rather useless information while in prison because with so many hours of the day left to idle away doing practically nothing, one needs to fill that time, and why not fill it with trivia? In truth, I wouldn't say that this woman's fast pace of walking reflects a peaceful state of mind. On the contrary, at a swift glance of her, I would be bold enough to say she's definitely not deliriously happy. She wears the weight of responsibility on her narrow shoulders, like someone who doesn't find life terribly easy. And I don't expect in her case she does. Indeed, I think half the people in New York, running around this metropolis like frantic hamsters on a treadmill, don't walk fast because they actually want to, 
It's more a case of being terribly afraid of being late for a conference or a meeting. Me, I'm soaking it all up, wallowing in the vibe of the city, and very glad that I don't have to be part of the spirited energy. I don't get why anyone would commute to New York every day, but hats off to her for doing it. I get why she lives in Hackenstack. The accommodation is naturally affordable. The town in Bergen County, northeastern New Jersey, boasts excellent schools, shopping malls, and multiple highways. With such good bus routes to New York, I'm rather surprised the woman doesn't take the bus. But it suits me fine that she prefers to commute from Hackenstock to Grand Central by train. The woman I'm choosing to follow is called Claudia Hansen. Her father, I believe, was originally from Frankfurt in Germany. Her mother is from Manhattan in New York, so she was raised in New York before her parents returned to Germany, where they currently now reside, upon her father's insistence, who was champing at the bit to return to his hometown of Breckensheim. I guess the surname Handsome points to her Germanic roots. Claudia, I understand, can speak fluent German, courtesy of her father, and her language is needed for her job, I believe where she regularly takes international calls from German customers. She works for a German organisation called Lambrung and is on the advertising team responsible with promoting sports products and health gimmicks to improve your athletic performances. Well, the performances of aspiring athletes, I imagine, and people interested in the great outdoors, so to speak. She works in one of the tower blocks in Midtown in Park Avenue, leaves the offices at exactly ten past twelve at lunch to pick up a sandwich from a coffee shop called the Blue Witch. A funny name for a coffee shop, if you ask me. But on the glass window pane are the words bedazzled and bewitched, so I guess they're rather describing the coffees like that. Almost as if to suggest, once you've had one of their coffees from the Blue Witch, you'll come under the Blue Witch's magic spell and be addicted to their coffees for the rest of your life. I had a coffee there the other day, but I can't say it was the best coffee I've ever tasted in New York. But the coffee shop does appear to have a booming trade, with hungry commuters picking up a cinnamon bun, doughnut or sandwich and coffee to go, to take back to the office with them. I understand the coffee shop came into being after the first Harry Potter book came into production. So I suppose names like the Blue Witch were pretty hip back then. I know exactly what this woman will order for her lunch. Yes, she's pretty non-adventurous, I'm afraid to say. She alternates with avocado and ham, tuna, mayonnaise and chicken and sweet corn, always eaten on granary bread, I notice, and served with a blue witch pumpkin latte, so she must have rather a sweet tooth on her. In the morning after she gets off the train at Grand Central, she always picks up a hot chocolate from the Blue Witch, along with a blueberry muffin. I knew when she left for work, she'd get the 1645 train to get back home. And the journey is an hour long, well, an hour and 11 minutes to be exact. I know exactly where she sits on the train. Every single morning and late afternoon, she manages to get the very same seat like clockwork. Everything about this 42-year-old woman is wonderfully predictable. And predictability makes my life so much easier. It would be a lot more complicated for me if she wasn't reliable. But reliable is her second name, it would appear. So I can pretty much predict her movements for an entire day. Almost as if studying a map of the Big Apple. That remains steadfastly the same. Obstensively, she knows exactly where to stand on the station platform at Grand Central to access the seat she wants, which she grabs as fast as she can when the train doors slide open. She likes the seat at the far end of the carriage with a table so she can pull out her laptop and tap away on the keyboard to her heart's content. And once Claudia Hansen gets stuck into her writing, she tunes the whole world out as so attentive is her focus. You've got to admire that, haven't you? She fails to hear someone sneezing a few seats down, or two sisters arguing about who should sit next to the window, further down the carriage. There are times on the train that I have sat very close to Claudia Hansen. 
shielding my eyes behind a pair of dark glasses and burying myself behind my cell phone, like so many commuters on this train. Claudia Hansen rather fancies herself as the next aspiring Harry Potter children's author. Let's not kid. She's got big dreams for herself. I suppose I rather admire her for that. But let's just say such dreams are pie in the sky, are they not? They are in no way realistic by any manner of means. The sad truth is pretty grim. By all accounts, very few children's authors will ever get the notoriety or success of J.K. Rowling. But I suppose the woman can dream. Nothing wrong with that. When it comes to myself, I'm extremely practical. Let's just say, for me, dreams I will never embrace. Because life is not like that. It's not airy-fairy. I like scrupulously cold, hard facts. Those are the only things that are reliable and going to naturally advance my life and help me to succeed in all my ambitious endeavours. Dreams will take you on a road to nowhere, unless, of course, you're extremely lucky. But I don't get this distinct impression that Claudia Hansen is terribly lucky. If that indeed were the case, I wouldn't be stalking her like a coyote after its prey. And by the time I've finished with her, her pockets will be significantly lighter. I don't live in a fairy tale world, but a ruthlessly realistic one. And my stint in prison for assault, when I beat a man almost to death, when I realised he'd been having it off with my girlfriend. I guess I just lost it. I was so angry with him. I mean, can any man blame me for that? I think not. I caught the two of them together, canoodling in my girlfriend's car. I gave him chase, and when he tried to run off, I ran right after him. Unfortunately, it was in a public place where spectators watched the whole thing unfold. I tried to beat this guy's brains out, and the man kept saying to me that my girlfriend had initiated everything. But that made me all the more mad, and my fists even more powerful. Before I knew it, I'd been cuffed and arrested by the police. Thankfully, the guy I almost throttled to death never died, or I might have faced a murder charge. I did end up breaking his nose and fracturing three of his ribs, but I wasn't sorry for what I did. Let's just say being in prison has sharpened my skills exponentially. I've learnt a few tricks along the way. When you're living among some aggressive inmates that have actually murdered people, sometimes in cold blood, you gleam quite a lot of pointers from these people. And you also learn about the mistakes that led to their incarceration in the first place. So you soon learn what not to do. And there are a lot of good lessons to be learned from people's mistakes. Let me tell you that. When you come out of prison, one thing you want for sure is to never return to that dreadful dump again. And if you have your wits about you, and are shrewd enough, there is no reason you ever will. Providing, of course, you're saliently clever. I wasn't terribly clever when I beat the man that was cheating with my girlfriend up in a public place. But I learnt some invaluable lessons in the process. And now I've realised that being cloak and dagger about things and cunning like a fox is the best way to get ahead in the world of crime. I intend to use these sharpened skills I acquired in prison to the very best of my ability, which is why my eyes are on the prize when it comes to Claudia Hansen. It's nothing personal, of course. It is what it is. Like any man who needs a financial windfall, I am no different. I want to make a living, but not the honest way. No, that's too much like hard work. It's so much easier to take exactly what you need in this dog-eat-dog world of ours. I don't want to be like Claudia Hansen herself, living like a hamster on a treadmill, getting up early and commuting to work day after day so drudgerously. No, that's not the life for me. I understand Claudia Hansen is eager to give up her job at Le Brun and is planning to become a children's author full-time. But you can't do that, can you, without significant money behind you? Yes, you've guessed it. Claudia Hansen has a little nest egg tucked away. 
but not in the bank as you might suppose. She has put a stack of cash away in a safe, a locked safe, of course, in her apartment. I intend to get my hands on all that money. And so that's pretty much why I've been following my mark around, to learn as much about her as I possibly can. And then I will strike when the time is right, or when the iron is hot, so to speak. Claudia Hansen is a single mother. She has a 16-year-old daughter called Courtney, with father unknown. I suppose the poor girl came into this life as a result of a one-night stand, and the mother, probably half-cut at the time, did not know who the father was. You hear stories like that all the time. Women getting brazenly drunk and letting go of all their inhibitions like a balloon on the wind. And the next thing you know, they discover that they've gotten themselves pregnant. Thank God I'm not a woman. I wouldn't like to be faced with such a problem. Life is hard enough, is it not? I imagine the man in question just slipped away like the morning dew never to be seen or heard from again, and probably has no idea he's actually fathered a little girl. Well, a teenage girl by now. It can't be easy to raise a young girl all on your own, without a father figure around. So you've got to admire Claudia Hansen for single-handedly raising her child. Although, according to my 18-year-old brother Keegan, Courtney is a little flaky, callow and extremely naive. He's told her he loves her to keep her sweet, and she's fallen for his affections, hook, line and sinker. So much so that I almost feel sorry for the poor mite. Perhaps after she wakes up to the cruel reality of what her wagging tongue has brought about in her life, she may begin to finally grow up, and to learn that telling a complete stranger there is a safe in your house containing over $40,000 may not be a very good idea. I persuaded my brother Keegan to keep Courtney as malleable as plasticine. She's going to be very useful to us when needs must. Because Courtney is the negotiation I will studiously employ with a Machiavellian brilliance and wit to make Claudia Hansen purge out the numbers of her safe, so she'll practically be begging us to take her nest egg. Obstensively, like so many long-suffering mothers, Claudia Hansen has a slightly tempestuous relationship with her teenage daughter, who during the summer holidays, while her mother is working in New York, has been a rather naughty little minx, shall we say. While her mother thinks her daughter's been a good girl, staying at home, watching Netflix, and keeping in touch with some of her friends on Instagram, she couldn't be more wrong about that. Let's just say when Claudia's back is turned... She is blindly oblivious to what is going on under her very nose, for there is no telling what her 16-year-old daughter Courtney is really getting up to while she's at work. It would seem the sweet little Courtney has a very keen eye for the boys. Many girls her age are boy crazy, are they not? They just can't help themselves. If Claudia had any idea that her daughter was canoodling with my brother, she would be less than amused. She has told her daughter in no uncertain terms that she's far too young to have a boyfriend. They say when the cat's away, the mice do play. And what self-respecting young teenager is actually ever going to listen to their mother's advice? Keegan has only been interested in Courtney for a little illicit canoodle, as with his raging, rather rampant teenage hormones. Commitment of any kind is the last thing on his young mind. He's happy for girls to come and go into his life, like the different flavours of ice cream you get from the parlour. For my brother can never stick to one flavour, because he likes them all. When Courtney brought him back to her mother's apartment at lunchtime, after meeting him at the mall, she would have never seen my brother for dust again, if she hadn't happened to let slip rather nonchalantly that her mother keeps $40,000 in her safe. Keegan's and Tenai were titillated and began to wag at the sound of $40,000. I mean, can you blame him for that? By all accounts, for anyone that is permanently skint like my brother always is, 40000 is like receiving the gold ticket, like the little boy Charlie in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. 
I mean, who wants to look a gift horse in the mouth? It's like watching a machine in the casino, purging out hundreds and hundreds of coins, and you're telling me you're going to walk away and ignore all the inviting money that is spilled out in front of you. My rather dithery brother Keegan knew he needed to keep Courtney as sweet as a pig in clover, while he told me about the $40,000 treasure trove waiting for us in a safe in Claudia Hansen's apartment that cannot be easily accessed without the code that only Claudia herself actually knows. Your mother keeps $40,000 in this apartment, my brother asked her incredulously. Why doesn't she use a bank like most people do? She does have a bank account, but she draws out a lot of money from it, storing it here at home. She doesn't trust the banks as far as you can throw them. She was scammed once, you see, by a horrible boyfriend of hers. That boyfriend got her bank details, transferring her funds into his own account. The bank pretty much didn't redeem the situation for my mother. They said it was a legitimate transaction, and if she had allowed her boyfriend to get her bank details, it was all her fault. Her boyfriend claimed that she had willingly transferred her money into his account. So ever since that debacle, and the bank refusing to help my mother out, she's pretty much grown wary of banks. She's got a bank account, of course, but she's always drawing out cash to keep here at home, in the safe. Sounds like she's had a loser boyfriend, backstabbing her like that. He was a loser. My mother has lousy taste in men. And let's just say Tony was always skint. My mother would lend him so much money, and she never ever knew what he spent it on. She thinks he might have had an addiction, a gambling addiction perhaps, but she couldn't be sure about that because she didn't really know much about Tony. So she keeps $40,000 in her safe, does she? Because of one bad experience with the bank? Pretty much. I've tried to open the safe myself on many occasions, said Courtney, to help myself to some of her cash. But I've tried all our birthdays and stuff like that. The safe stubbornly does not oblige me. My mother's rarely mean. She refuses to give me any money. While she's at work, I'm stuck here all on my own. What does she expect me to do all day without any spending money at my disposal? It would be nice to do a bit of shopping, buy a few nice things, and even go away for a week or so with one of my girlfriends. She could have given me money to have fun, but my mother is so thrifty always intent on saving money whenever possible because she wants to give up her job at Lebrun where she works and focus on her writing career. Writing career, you say? said my brother, sounding impressed. Your mother's an author, is she? Not exactly, said Courtney. More likely she fancies herself as one. She wants to be like J.K. Rowling and write a children's book to set the world alight, to make us millions, I suspect. Do you think she will succeed in her goals? Of course not, said Courtney. How many authors will ever end up like J.K. Rowling? That woman got very lucky, and she was talented, and I dare say that helped a bit. Maybe your mother's talented too. What is her writing like? I'm not sure, said Courtney, making a face. I've never read her stuff. I have no interest in reading it either. Honestly... I can't imagine my mother writing a story. I just can't. My brother found this statement rather astonishing. For you would have thought Courtney would have feigned some interest in her mother's writing. But at 16 it would seem her focus was on more interesting things to her, like dresses and shoes that she had seen at the mall that she wanted to buy. Who knows what goes on in the mind of a 16-year-old girl? When my brother told me that Claudia Hansen was keeping over $40,000 in a safe in her apartment, that was when I began to follow her around very discreetly, as a plan began to form in my head. I persuaded my brother Keegan to help me orchestrate this plan, although if the truth be told, Keegan is a bit of a buffoon, without wishing to be too unkind. My brother is the kind of fellow that draws in women like some fishermen can bring in a good haul of fish at the end of the day. Keegan may be good-looking, with the surfer boy blonde hair, tan skin and eyes so blue they almost look piercing, but his brain doesn't exactly coordinate with his attractive veneer. That, I hasten to say, has fooled so many girls, including my own mother growing up. 
As far as my mother was concerned, Keegan was always her blue-eyed little boy. She doted on him, hand and foot, lavishing her undivided attention on him, giving him everything his heart desired. My brother's been rather pampered and spoiled over the years. Even my mother couldn't help herself being beguiled by his irresistibly good looks. I was the disappointment in our family, the one always getting myself into heaps of trouble with the police. My mother thought I was a bad influence on little Keegan. And when I went to jail for assault, she cut all ties with me, telling me in no uncertain terms how disgusted and revulsed she was with me. You almost killed a man, son, because he was canoodling with your girlfriend. And I don't understand such bizarre behaviour. I do understand, of course, that it's not right to cheat on your partner. But for goodness sake, get a grip, son. You don't go attempting to kill someone because your ego's been badly bruised. I don't want you going anywhere near my Keegan ever again. You're a bad influence on him. It's pathetic what you did. And in your case, you're very lucky you didn't get charged with murder and put away in prison for life. I'm ashamed to call you my son. And if I don't ever see you again, it'll be far too soon. Since I've been out of prison, unbeknown to my mother... Keegan is sharing an apartment with me. As far as my mother knows, I'm still locked away in a prison cell. But I got out early for very good behaviour. In prison, if you keep a low profile and you keep your head down and try to remain as inconspicuous as possible, it's a good way to survive. Let's just say if my mother were remotely aware I was out and hanging around with my brother, filling his head with my warped ideas... She'd probably be giving birth to kittens by now. She's warned Keegan off me, but Keegan has always been rather bedazzled by his big brother, so I pretty much got him under my control. Keegan, how shall I put this as tactfully as I can, without being unduly unkind? Let's just say he's a little dopey, a bit of an airhead in a masculine sort of way. He's not the sharpest tool in the box, if you know what I mean. But he will be rather useful in this plan of mine. He's eager to get his hands on this $40,000 as much as I am. If push comes to shove, he'll do exactly as I say, even if he has to get slightly physical with Courtney. But I doubt that that will happen. If Claudia knows what's good for her, she'll do exactly as I say. And I have a good feeling about her. I told Keegan once we got the $40,000... I would split it with him in half. If the truth be told, that is not going to happen. I'll give him $5,000 of the windfall, and that's being generous. If Keegan wasn't my brother, I'd bugger off with all the money and do a runner on him. But given he's my brother, I have a soft spot for him. I'm the mastermind behind this plan, which I'm pretty certain will work. Another thing playing a harmonious tune to my great advantage is that Claudia Hansen is the perfect person to rob. As like any mother, she's very attached to her daughter, despite their obvious differences. By the looks of things, she has no close friends. Her parents live far away in Germany, and she doesn't trust the bank's authority. And if you're looking to take advantage of someone, as far as I'm concerned, Claudia fits the bill perfectly. There she is standing on the station platform, at Grand Central, as predicted. She looks like she does every single day of the week. She's wearing a sensible navy skirt that comes up to above her knees, and a smart, well-fitted jacket, in a matching navy. She looks reasonably presentable. Her brown hair is tied back in a neat ponytail. I watch her opening her red leather handbag, and pulling out her rather flashy cell phone. I'm quite sure she's giving her daughter a call. It won't be long when the train rolls in onto the station platform. Claudia, I'm standing on the platform at Grand Central Station, waiting for my train to come in, so I can grab my usual seat like I always do every day. Somehow, if someone does manage to get to my seat first, which has happened very rarely, I feel almost as if a joint of mine has been knocked out of place. I'm soulfully reflecting on the argument I had with my daughter, Courtney, when I returned home the previous afternoon. 
The apartment had been in such an atrocious state. Her bedroom looked like a hurricane had hit it, with gale-force winds leaving clothes distributed over chairs, the floor, and everywhere else besides. The kitchen looked as if a bomb had hit it, as my daughter had attempted to make a chocolate cake, having never baked a thing a day in her life before. So it looked as if a laboratory experiment had gone badly wrong, and canisters of very messy brown goo, formed from the cocoa powder, sugar, butter and eggs, were rigidly sticking to the backsplashes, the countertops, and of course the kitchen floor. My daughter had treaded chocolate on the cream carpet in the hallway, and I knew that that would not be a walk in the park to get out. If that wasn't bad enough, Courtney appeared to have used every single bowl that was available in the kitchen, just to make one chocolate cake, which didn't turn out well either. The whole cake was as flat as a pancake. I was naturally angry with my daughter, especially when she expected me to come home after a hard day at work to clean up after her. That's not how it works around here. The least I would expect from Courtney is to keep the place moderately respectable. While I don't mind her attempting to teach herself how to make a chocolate cake, I didn't expect her to cause such mayhem and chaos in her wake. My daughter is on her summer holidays, so she has no excuse to be so slapdash and sloppy about things. It's not as if she's got tons of homework to worry about. She's got all the time in the world to clean up after herself. What she doesn't know is that I need this apartment to look spick and span and scrupulously clean when I leave the keys on the kitchen countertop for the landlord in the morning because he's going to need them when he lets out the place again to somebody else. Courtney has no idea we're moving away and that tonight we have a lot of packing up to do. There are some things I would not like to tell a tempestuous teenage girl who would abhor the very idea of moving away from all she knows and loves. But I'm not going to miss out on an opportunity like this where I can spend some time focusing on my writing career and abandoning the rat race of New York. And let's just say this is a dream come true in every sense of the word for me that pretty much fell into my lap like manna from heaven, almost as if God himself had orchestrated the paths to be cleared especially for me, ostensibly with $40,000 stashed away safely in my apartment. I've got the financial means not to have to work for a long while, if we're thrifty, of course, with our money. And by the time I've used up the funds, I'm hoping that my first book will be complete, ready to be published. You may wonder why I hadn't told my petulant teenager my plans. I was afraid of another blazing row with her. I just know how she will react if I told her this sobering news, which I've kept on the back burner for a quite a while, never quite finding the right time to tell her my plans. I decided I would tell her at the very last minute that we were moving away and I was preparing myself emotionally for the lightning strike of a very formidable temper tantrum that would leave the faint of heart with trembling knees. Let's just say Courtney can be rather unpredictable, like the weather. But when she flies into a moment of disagreeable indignation, you need to brace yourself for the discharge of unkind words that will be launched your way like missiles from a war zone. It would seem a long-lost great-aunt on my mother's side of the family left my mother her little cottage close to a pretty town in Colorado. There are so many small towns in Colorado that most people don't know even exist. This is one of those rather ambiguous towns. When my mother inherited the cottage called the Fox and Cat, she said I could have it, as she had no need of it. My parents both live in Germany, and are not going to be rushing back to America any time soon. It seems they really enjoy their new lives they're making for themselves in Frankfurt, and they spend their spare time travelling all around Europe, from Greece to Turkey, France and Spain. My father took early retirement, and has made enough money to never have to need to work again. It's all right for some people, isn't it? I have no idea, sweetheart, what the cottage is like. My mother told me, this is a relative of mine. I've never met her, but she chose to leave me her cottage in her will. And it's yours if you would like it. I would be grateful if you'd actually take it off my hands. But are you sure, mum? I asked. Of 
absolutely certain, love. What's a cottage going to do for me while I'm living in Germany? I certainly don't want it. I don't need it either. I thought it might be the perfect writing retreat for you to begin to follow your dream. It's about time you did something like that for yourself. Mum, you're a gem. I won't say no to this offer. I'd be a fool not to accept it. Good, I'm glad that you're going to take it off my hands. I really don't want to be burdened with so much responsibility. Not at my age, anyway. i tell you what I will do. I will contact the solicitors forthwith and get the deeds to the cottage signed over to you. I understand the place is fully furnished. And you can keep or throw anything out that you don't want. If you want to sell the place and pocket the money, be my guest. It's all up to you, sweetheart. Although, to be honest with you, I haven't got a clue what the place is worth or what it is like. Mum, I don't know what to say. Thank you so much. Well, it's not me you should be thanking, but that long-lost ambiguous relative down our family line. I just need to warn you, sweetheart, the place could be an absolute dump for all you know. Remember, I've never been to the cottage or even met the woman. So rarely it's a little hit and miss whether it will be a desirable place to live or not. But Colorado is a magnificent part of the world, and I immediately thought it might be a nice retreat where you could focus on your writing, so to speak. How did this woman die? I asked. I understand from the solicitors. She took a tumble and then died shortly afterwards. I don't know the details, I'm afraid. She was probably dreadfully old and frail. For your sake, I hope she wasn't a hoarder. So you might have a whole lot of mess that you need to deal with or throw out. When I realised that I could live in a cottage called the Fox and Cat in the Colorado countryside, which I understand is spectacularly beautiful, I was over the moon about the prospect. I really should have gone to Colorado and checked out the place, but my eagerness to move meant I was driven by a wistful impulse, more than actually common sense. I had saved up over $40,000 in cash, which I placed very cautiously in my home. Although I had a little money in the bank, I didn't trust banks as far as you could throw them, and preferred to keep cash in my apartment for safety reasons. Some might believe that only old people hoard money, but they would be wrong about that. I've never trusted banks and have been stung by them and all their clandestine charges more times than I care to remember. So me and banks, let's just say... We're not the very best of friends. So there we are. That is the end of part one. Part two is tomorrow night, and I look forward to you joining me then. Until next time, goodbye and good night.